This first question isn't about a DIY segment. If I say what are the key ingredients required successfully to capture the state, I'm not looking for a list that enables you to go out and do it as much as you would like to because it seems like it's a fairly simple thing to do. Have one wealthy, powerful, well-connected family, some receptive and perhaps vulnerable subjects, and there you have a captured state. Well, an essential element of any state capture agenda is to act as benefactor, of course, and to choose your victims very, very carefully. Typically, it starts with decaying infrastructure with a collapsing country, and that is when a country is most vulnerable. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, we're talking about South Africa's state of capture with Peter J. Nivenhaisen, who is the Chief Financial Officer at the Growth Institute, and joining us on Skype, Leanne Govansami, the Head of Legal and Investigations at Corruption Watch. Now, let's start with you if we can, and that is that you have written to the Finance Minister Malus Gigaba to say it's all well and good that the President has signed into law the FICA Act, uh, but unless it's going to be officially implemented, it's not worth a piece of paper it's written on. Is he deliberately dragging his feet in your view? I mean, look, there's significant reason for him to, to do this very quickly. We have a FATF review, the Financial Action Task Force review, in June. Um, and, you know, it becomes really important to make sure that we have the right kind of implementation of the Act, now Act, um, that regulations are put in place, that there's a list of prominent influential persons, all in order to support the implementation of the legislation. So. We, we, we do think that this, there is a delay and that the delay is completely unwarranted um, and that there should be an awareness, at least from the ministry and, and the department, um, that this FATF review is going ahead and it could impact negatively on us. It all depends, I suppose, on how much credence you put in the two terabytes of emails, the equivalent of 3,000 CD-ROMs of data, the 200,000 emails that are in the hands of Amabungani of the Sunday Times and of City Press, um, as to whether or not there is any suggestion that the minister himself is potentially compromised when it comes to politically connected persons. Um, that puts him in an, quite an invidious position, potentially. Yes, potentially it does place them in a difficult position. Um, we've said all along that, you know, we have wanted this legislation to be in place because it enables banks to better detect suspicious transactions and report it to the Financial Intelligence Center. So perhaps some of the transactions that have been going on for a really long time could have been detected and reported to the FIC uh, had the legislation been in place. But um, you know, it does place people in, in difficult positions. It will place a lot of people in, in difficult positions um, if you are at risk. So the important thing to remember is that if you're engaging in any kind of risky financial behavior, that this places you at risk, whether from the private sector or from the, or, or from the state. I mean, it's purely coincidental, of course, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but here is a president who declined to sign FICA into law for an awfully long period of time. He's now handed it over to his brand new finance minister to implement. And we look at the emails that have been leaked out in the last 10 days or so, and one has to then question the motives for the delays. The president is named in emails, the president son Duduzani is named in emails, and the finance minister Malusi Gigaba through his various iterations in government, through his job at the Department of Public Enterprises and later at the Department of Home Affairs and now in Treasury, also has his name mentioned an indecent number of times and not in a positive way. Um, he's damned if he does implement this law and he's damned, we're damned if he doesn't, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, we, we have to look at, at, at these processes that are, that are at play here, right? Um, this particular piece of legislation adopts a risk-based approach to financial intelligence, that is the detecting of uh, financial transactions by banking institutions, estate agents, etc. Um, and then you've got to look at the evidence that has been presented to Amma Bungani and others around state capture. Um, and that could be evaluated on its own. You could essentially have the law enforcement authorities look at allegations of corruption in terms of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act, whether there's sufficient evidence there, um, you know, to lodge criminal charges, to have them investigated, um, all those kinds of processes. So I, I guess at the, at, the, at the same time as the, the FICA Act 
would enable better detection, um, it is done uh, as part of an array of other pieces of legislation that could also be used. Nian Govansami, thank you so much. I'm going to let you go. The Skype signal is letting us down a bit. There's a bit of a delay as well, as there often is with Skype. Leanne Govansami uh, from Corruption Watch, thank you very much. They've written to the Finance Minister saying it's time that you implemented this piece of uh, legislation, please, Mr. Minister. However, one wonders why the Minister now seems to be dragging his feet on this particular topic. Uh, Peter J. van Nievenhuysen is the Chief Financial Officer at the Growth Institute. Your perspective on state capture and the how to, we, we're watching and reading with increased fascination how these emails are rolling out a very simple process of people corrupting each other quite far down the value chain of corruptive of corruptiveness if you like Bruce that is indeed a concern I think for the most for, for the whole of the country but I think we cannot look at state capture merely blaming one or two big companies and say that is the be all and end all of it I think state capture has got the legacy it goes back to at least 1994, even pre-1994, when, when we started to see brain drains happening in this country. Education systems have started to fall into decay, and I believe that a lot of state capture is also the reason of people not being able to discern between wrong and right. People are not able to do basic calculations when they're presented with a tender, and they're not able to spot where there are potentials well, of Where corruption. is your primary concern? That the public sector was the subject of a significant brain drain say, between 94 and 98, um, and that that has left government departments vulnerable and people with, with sharp mathematical skills have been able to infiltrate, and, and malleable uh, virtue have been able to infiltrate government departments? It's not, that is exactly not, just, in, it's not yes. truly just in government, though. It's not just in government, but, but we do believe that is exactly what happened. There was a vulnerability that happened, and the state started to fi find themselves in a state of desperation. They could not deliver specific services, they didn't perhaps know how to deliver p services, experience are no longer there to support the decision makers or the people who have to do the implementation. So now you sit with the classic idea of fly by the by the seat of your pants. You need to respond on impulse, you have to respond uh, under a lot of pressure from seniors to get work done and get things done. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why it was so easy to let state capture happen. Because who's going to say no to your boss? Who's going to say no to the boss's boss in the end of the day? Um, the Financial Sector Committee, um, uh, which has been very, very vociferous um, in its criticism of the, the President's failure to implement FICA, for example, has been very critical and has been doing its job very diligently, perhaps in the last six months, more than in the previous six months before that. We are seeing some of these committees taking their jobs increasingly seriously as it becomes pretty obvious that the system is crumbling. Absolutely, and I think the last downgrade that we had in the country, that now that we're on junk status, that started to serve as an unintended catalyst, and it helped people to start to ask whether we're on the right course or not. And I think it is now for the first time that we start to see an awareness that corruption needs to, to be a, uh, um, um, looked at. The corruption is a real phenomenon. It is not just something that the disgruntled politician or the opposition parties fabricated just to give the president some heat. But isn't that the, what, what is so marvelous about these emails? They, the, the people who are subjected to being named and shamed in these emails aren't going to like them one little bit. But even if 10% of what is in the emails turns out to be completely factual and admissible in the court of law at some point in the future, we're light years ahead of where we were. This information, better out than in, so to speak. Absolutely. I think what we need to ask ourselves is why did it take us so long to, to get this information? I'm glad that the leaks occurred. I'm not going to say that it is a bad thing. I would have liked to see this happening years ago. Sure. As we started to see things turning south after 2004, for example, we should have already started to know that. Turning south in 2004, we were going through a period of economic growth. The economy was you know, teetering on almost 5% growth. We were happy to sweep a lot of stuff under the carpet at that particular point. It only really became completely apparent and where there was fact-based evidence in the Public Protector's State of Capture report. Up until that point, a lot of it was conjecture, a lot of it was whispers, fact-based. But there was no evidence. The scorpions had been dealt with at Polokwane. Um, the state prosecution apparatus, investigative apparatus, had been effectively dismantled to ensure that this sort of stuff could happen.
Well, you're right, and you know, prosperity sometimes has the effect of uh, hiding you away from the actual truth. Yeah. Prosperity can blind you, and prosperity has the tendency of st creating denialism. Mm. And we do not want to hear about bad things when it seems that the company is in a growth phase. Yeah. And of course, with the Moody's downgrade, suddenly we need to, to start find causes and reasons for this. Luckily, or perhaps unfortunately, I don't know, we had the situation of finding the obvious scapegoat, which was Zuma. Mm. And when the pressure started to become unbearable, clearly people st started to take a cue to the opposition and to, for example, the EFF and their vo vocalization about state capture. And the, it was like a thin wedge driven, being driven into a big lock. Mm. There is a point where there can no longer be resistance. No. Absolutely. We're getting close to that point, I suspect, simply because the, the, the tidal wave of information is too strong. Do we see improvement from here in terms of the, the state capture agenda? Because this can't be just about two families. It can't just be about the Guptas and the Zumas. It, it's, it feels more pervasive and more inbuilt and perhaps more, it feels like it's penetrated far deeper than that. Bruce, I shudder to think about the pervasiveness it's of a, It's a capture. terrible word that It's yes. a terrible word. <laughs> I think what we need to be ready for is it will take us a time to recover. I do not think state capture will simply go away or the fixed therapy will go away by simply replacing the current president with somebody else. I think we need to go and build capabilities mm -hmm. and, and competencies again. We had a discussion in our EXCO about this a week or so ago, and we believe we have to go back and start to revamp the entire education system. We need to start to get people to ask critical questions. Let not accept, accept any odd explanation. Ask the questions. Don't hesitate to ask. Learn how to check for veracity of things, learn how to check out facts, and then hopefully we can start to see an improvement. No government has ever benefited from that kind of thinking, Peter Nivenesen. I mean, from the days of HF we've brought through to today, education has let South Africans down very, very badly indeed. But my thanks to Peter J. van Nivenesen, who is the Chief Financial Officer at the Growth Institute. Poor you guys must be quiet now, 0.6%. Um, but anyway, we need to get it back to the 5% levels. We need to get back to a point where we are creating a million jobs over the next couple of years, but it's not going to happen without some aggressive intervention. Also to Leanne Govansami, Head of Legal and Investigations at Corruption Watch. Thank you for joining us this evening. More stories. The story is the one that's going to keep on giving as the emails keep vomiting out information onto the internet and we'll try and keep you appraised of the big developments. Until next time, good night.